Welcome everyone to the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences third downtown lecture series on happiness. Third, three out of five, that means this is the hump lecture on the hump day. Uh, it's great to see so many people. Uh, I was in an elevator uh, yesterday and somebody turned and said, do you uh, plan to go to the happiness lecture tomorrow? And, and the person responded, no one goes there anymore, it's too crowded. <laughs> Apologies to Yogi Berra for that, but I will say, I will say that uh, when I walked in this morning, uh, this afternoon a little bit late, um, uh, the usher asked me for a ticket and I said, I don't have one, and she said, you can't go in. <laughs> um, I want to welcome all the people who are also watching at the overflow facility at TEP Unisource and also um, a large number of people now in triple figures watching on azpm.org thanks to our partnerships with uh, both TEP Unisource and AZPM and um, thank you very much for making this lecture available to, uh, to everyone live streamed. <laughs> Last week uh, Dr. Chuck Raison from the C Department of Psychiatry spoke with, uh, to us about compassionate training and how we might use it to enhance our happiness through equanimity and through um, empathy for others. And tonight, we're going to answer another question that I introduced during the uh, first of the series, and that is the question of whether or not places and built environments uh, can make us happy. Uh, Dr. Esther Sternberg is going to talk about that. Um, it's a trick question, of course, the answer is yes. Um, more importantly, of course, is um, how do make places make us happy, through what mechanisms, and why? And uh, those are going to be the, the remarks that she will make tonight. Um, before I introduce her, I'd like to call out a few uh, partners who have uh, helped us put this event on. Um, First of all, we have a number of partners in the health and wellness area. Um, Miraval, Arizona Resort and Spa, Body Works Pilates, Path to Happiness, and the EOS Foundation. Thanks to uh, all of you for your contributions. <laughs> at the University of Arizona, a very special thanks to Diana Liverman and her colleagues at the Institute The embarrassment overflowing. Uh, she was especially keen to contribute to uh, Esther's talk, and so I wanted to call her out uh, uh, in particular tonight, and also to our other co-sponsors from the uh, University of Arizona, the Department of Philosophy and the uh, Center for the Philosophy of Freedom. And uh, not last, our downtown partners, uh, which include uh, Vicki Jacobs and Diana Tolton from uh, Tierra Antigua Realty. They don't just work downtown, in case you're interested. And also, uh, Janos Wilder from downtown uh, Kitchen and Cocktails. And I'm very pleased tonight to add uh, Richard and Shana Oserin from Maynard's Market and Kitchen. The Maynard's Market will, is fully renovated, will be open very soon, and I know that will add even more to the, uh, to the richness of uh, the downtown area. Um, our lead sponsors are Tucson Medical Center, the uh, gracious contributions from the SPS Magellan Circle, and uh, if you um, are interested in how to join, you can talk to me or anyone running around here in a uh, blue shirt. We really appreciate the, the, the help of uh, the many members of the community uh, who give generously to the college and also the Arizona Daily Star. Uh, I especially want to thank John Humanick, uh, the publisher and the editor, uh, Bobby Joel Buell. Uh, they have been very keen to participate in community dialogue around important issues, and we're happy to, to partner with them. In the case of happiness, this includes a, a blog on happiness, a live chat, every Friday from noon to one, 
uh, following each Wednesday's lecture, and a happiness word grid uh, that you will uh, undoubtedly hear more about tonight. And um, to help sort of seal the, uh, the partnership, I'd like to ask the editor of the Arizona Daily Star, Bobby, M uh, Bobby Joe Buell, to come up and say a few words. Bobby Joe. Thank you, JP. Are there Arizona Daily Star readers here? I thought so. And you are exactly the reason that the Star is a sponsor of this lecture series. When JP first came to the Star and talked to John Humanick, our president and publisher, John was quick to sign on as a sponsor of this event. And he did that because we know two things for sure about Daily Star readers. You are curious and you are active participants in the community. And in that sense, this lecture series is an extension of the sort of explanatory, idea-minded journalism that we know that you value. We're also pleased to support, again, uh, another way in which the University of Arizona is opening its doors, and in this case, inviting the community in to share in its research. And this has been happening more and more in the past few years. One example probably all of you know about is the Tucson Festival of Books, which will be coming up again in March and celebrating a sixth its sixth anniversary, and that's a partnership of the university and the star. Um, we are two of the oldest institutions in this community. The star is 136, and the U of A, a young 128. <laughs> and so we are happy to say that after all these years, we are still finding new ways to work together to ensure that Tucson is a great place to live. Thank you for reading, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Bobby Joe. And now it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Esther Sternberg, who is a physician and world renowned for her work on brain stress responses to health and illness. Um, she's one of the leading figures in mind body medicine. Uh, with many awards from organizations as diverse as the UN and Fortune Magazine, as well as many professional societies. She's also had an audience uh, with the Pope and with the Dalai Lama. So for those of you at home, turn off your cell phones and sit up straight. <laughs> Dr. Sternberg uh, received her bachelor's and, mass and, and medical degree uh, at the McGill University in Montreal and um, she moved to Washington University in St. Louis, uh, where, in fact, uh, our previous speaker also had spent some time. And in 1986, she moved to the National Institutes of Health. And um, she worked her way through the NIH to become the section chief for neuroendocrine immunology and behavior, which is sort of like the dean of College of Social and Behavioral Sciences in terms of difficulty of saying. And this was at the National Institute for Mental Health uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, she came to the University of Arizona in 2012. She joined the faculty as a professor in the College of Medicine. And she also serves as research director, director for the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, which uh, I'm sure all of you know is one of the feathers in the cap of the U of A College of Medicine founded by Dr. Andy Weil in 1994. Uh, Dr. Sternberg also holds a joint appointment in the College of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture. And she is the founding director of the Institute of Place and Wellness at the U of A, the object of which is the study of how places and the built environment can influence our health, our spiritual well-being, and our emotional uh, stability. Um, the, um, uh, the work that Dr. Uh, Sternberg has been uh, involved in has also included a great deal of public outreach. She has been the co-host and also the director and um, producer of a PBS documentary on the science of wellness. She's uh, written two popular books, books, one of which, Health Spaces, uh, is not only 
available in better bookstores, but also after tonight's lecture can be signed in the Fox lobby. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Esther Sternberg. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, JP, for that wonderful introduction. It is a thrill for me to be back here at the Fox Theater. Uh, I was here three years ago on a panel with Andy Weil and Victoria Mazes of the Center for Integrative Medicine when we screened my PBS television special here at the Fox. I had no idea then that in such a short time I would be here back on this stage, this time as one of you, as a Tucsonan. And I am so happy about it. So far in the previous two lectures, you've heard about the question, what is happiness? I'm going to talk about where is happiness. You might wonder, what is a rheumatologist, an arthritis doc, standing here and talking about place and well-being? Well, it was a long journey that started 10 years after I discovered that the brain's stress center was important in susceptibility to arthritis, when I went through a period of stress in my own life and developed inflammatory arthritis, and then serendipitously went to Greece with neighbors where I began to heal. And that experience made me ask, what was it about that place that helped me heal? And could I bring a little bit of it back with me home? That is what my books are about. That is what the television show is about. And that is what this lecture is going to be about. How can we all create a healing, happy place for ourselves? Before I answer that question, I'll tell you a story because during the course of writing the book, I had the privilege of meeting many experts in this area and learning a tre tremendous amount about how places uh, and spaces can be designed to change our moods. I was at a dinner party in Georgetown in Washington, DC, and the gentleman to my left turned to me and said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm writing a book on how place and space around you can change your emotions and either stress you or make you happy and help you heal. And he said, eh, we used to do that all the time. <laughs> so I said, who are you? And what did you do? And where did you do it? And he said, well, I used to be vice president of Disney Imagineering. <laughs> so he proceeded to explain to me how in the Disney theme parks, they explicitly create spaces to take people from a place of fear and anxiety to one of hope and happiness. And I interrupted him and I said, you know, it would be a lot better if I got a personal tour of Disneyland. <laughs> And with the magic of Disney, I did. So there I am, probably the only nerd in Disneyland carrying a, a, a pad and pencil, but I'm happy, <laughs> as are all the people around me. I want you to now close your eyes and think about a happy place. You can open them. <laughs> Through time immemorial, people have imagined a happy place and they called this paradise. If you Google the word paradise, you find 211 million images come up on the web in 0.21 seconds. And most of these are images of nature. And apparently you all agree with that because in the Arizona Daily Star poll on the blog that went along with this lecture series, when you had to enter things about Tucson that made you happy, most of the words referred to elements of nature. The mountains, the, the desert, the smell of creosote after the rain. There are actually scientific studies that address this. How many of you are from Chicago? Okay, I, I, there's a lot of people in Tucson from the 
Midwest and the West. Those of us, I'm from Montreal, and we usually go down south to Florida. But <laughs> This is, or was, the Robert Taylor Homes, an inner city project in Chicago, no longer exists. There's a famous study by Kuo and Sullivan published in the late 1990s, where they looked at people who were randomly assigned to apartments that had a view of a grove of trees, and others that had a view of a blacktop cement. And they found that the people who had a view of a grove of trees were, on the whole, happier. They had less violent behaviors, less aggressive, less aggressive feelings, and they had more interactions, positive interactions with friends and neighbors. So in science, we can ask two kinds of questions. We can ask whether something has an effect. That's the Kuo and Sullivan study. Whether, uh, whether place has an effect on emotions. And we can ask, how does it have an effect? Is it what you see? Is it what you hear? Is it what you smell? Is it what you touch? Is it what you do in the space? Is it all of the above? For those of you taking the quiz at the end, it's all of the above. No, I'm not going to give you a quiz. And again, in science, we tend to break things down into their smallest controllable parts. So we can ask the question, is it what you see? What is it about nature that makes you happy? You can break that question down further and say, is it the view? Is it the pattern? Is it the color? Is it the light? And you can study each of these rigorously and scientifically. And that's the difference between what we can do now and what John Hench, the original Disney Imagineer, did back in the 1950s when they did this by trial and error. So let's look at view. How many of you love to look at this view? <laughs> That's the Santa Catalina Mountains, one of the most wonderful things about Tucson. No matter how tired and stressed I am at the end of the day, and of course I'm not because I love my job and the university is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I know the provost is somewhere out there. <laughs> so I look at those mountains and I feel calm and happy and a sense of peace. Well, why is that? Well, what happens when you look at a beautiful view? And there are these universal preferred scenes that no matter how old you are, no matter what culture you're from, no matter what the gender, uh, any, any other aspects of an individual, preferred scenes tend to be sweeping views and nature. So when you look at that view, the first thing that happens is the image goes to the back of your brain, to the visual cortex. And when it arrives at the visual cortex, it is a black and white line drawing like a children's coloring book that has not yet been filled in, and it's upside down and backwards. The brain is a brilliant animator, way better than Disney or Pixar. And what happens when you look at that view is after it leaves the back of the brain and the visual cortex, it moves forward under the brain to the beautiful view spot. So the brain is not a bowl of mush. It has many specialized areas that recognize different things. So there's a part of the brain that recognizes faces and a part that recognizes uh, animals and tools and buildings. How many of you are architects? I think there are probably a lot of design, people in the design field here. Uh, I usually say when I speak to architecture audiences that whoever designed the brain must have been an architect because there is a spot that recognizes buildings. <laughs> the beautiful view spot is, is different. It is specifically recognizes these beautiful scenes. Irving Biederman at the University of Southern California has a hypothesis as to why we all prefer to look at beautiful views. It turns out that that spot, the beautiful view spot, is rich in endorphins. And why else, says Irving Biederman, would we pay more for a room with a view? We are giving ourselves a shot of endorphins every time we look at a beautiful view, those calming anti-pain molecules. What about pattern? We can do the same thing. We can dissect this question in a similar manner. Well, there's something about views of nature that we all like to look at, and that's called fractals. Fractals are repeating geometries identical at every scale. 
Think about veins on a leaf, leaves on a twig, twigs on a branch, branches on a trunk. Snowflakes are a perfect example. Or cactus. You look at the, the spines on the cactus, the, the ribs on the cactus, the straight cactus. You can, we can spend an hour looking at this image and looking for um, fractals. We can invent a new game, where's fractal? <laughs> well, the landscape architects in Japan of the 14th century who created this beautiful, calming uh, space, the Rianji Temple in Kyoto, figured this out by trial and error. And recently, Japanese scientists applied mathematical tools to analyze the relationship of the boulders in this garden. Originally, they were thought to be put there just randomly or to represent mother, a mother a lion and her cubs, uh, heart and mind. But when the scientists analyzed the fractal relationships of these boulders to each other, they found that the lines of symmetry passed exactly through the place where the person was supposed to stand to achieve the greatest sense of peace. And that place in the temple is not in the center of the temple. It's a little bit to the side, so it's sort of counterintuitive. But those, Jap those ancient landscape architects figured it out and knew that fractal geomet geometries were pleasing. Well, what about color? Most of our mood associations with color of calming peace and quiet with blues and greens and excitement and happiness and desire with yellows and reds and oranges are probably learned. And the reason we know that is that there are studies that show that you can unlearn those associations and most of them involve alcohol. <laughs> there is another theory in evolutionary biology, which poses the hypothesis that perhaps some of this is in our genes. It turns out that the oldest color receptors in the back of the eye, the genes for the oldest color receptors, are in the blues and greens, in the, in the range of blues and greens. The newest color receptors for reds and, orange, and yellows came online only 30 to 40 million years ago at exactly the same time as primates began eating fruit. So the evolutionary biology theory is perhaps the default mode for quiet and calm is in our genes when we look at the green forest background, and the default mode for excitement and desire is in our genes when we look at the red, because being able to identify the red luscious fruit on the background of the greens gave those primates a survival advantage. What about light? Light is the easiest thing to study. And the reason is because you can control the wavelength of light, the duration you're exposed to it, the intensity, and you can measure something. Now, Celeste, uh, um, uh, the, our, the, our first speaker, mentioned that there's something about the sun belt where people are happier, generally in the sun belt. There is a form of seasonal affective disorder, a form of depression called seasonal affective disorder, which occurs mostly in northern climes where there's long periods of low light and darkness. And that form of depression is treated extremely effectively with looking at full spectrum sunlight in a light box or with real full spectrum sunlight. And it's certainly more effective than placebo, and it's as effective as treatment with uh, antidepressant drugs. Now, there are other studies similar to the, to the ones that uh, I described earlier, which were done in Canada in the winter and Italy in the summer when the intensity of light was very bright, which showed that people with many forms of depression who randomly were assigned to the sunny side of the ward left hospital on average two to four days sooner than people who were on the dark side of the ward. What about what you hear? I'm going to show you a clip now from that PBS television special, The Science of Healing, that talks about how what you hear, and in particular music, can change your moods. I joined in a favorite village activity, listening and dancing to music. It didn't seem to matter if I was tired, hot, or hungry. I could listen for hours. I wondered 
Why did music make me feel so good? Music can serve as a stress buffer. It can relieve stress. It can take you out of your stressful day-to-day -day life and transport you to a dream world, so to speak, where life is beautiful. And it's, I think, an extremely healthy uh, phenomenon. Julian Thayer did not start out as a psychophysiologist. He started out as a musician. And he began to wonder why it is that music had such a profound effect on his emotions and on the emotions of people who listened to his music. Music is a very powerful force in our lives. It's endured and it's in every culture, everywhere, used in all kinds of situations. When I was in music school, I was a composition major, and I was told by my music composition teachers, if you write music this way, people will feel a certain emotion. But the music that Scott and myself were playing broke all the rules of Western music. So the question for me became, what are people actually responding to? What I discovered was that the same parameters of sound that produce mood effects in music were present in paralinguistic speech, in what's called motherese, talking to babies, and in animal communication. So the same exact parameters produce the same emotions across species. Dr. Thayer uses changes in heart rate variability to track how the listener is responding to music. Heart rate is the number of beats per minute, while heart rate variability is how the rate changes over time. When you inhale, your heart rate increases, and when you exhale, it decreases. And this is due to both the neural and mechanical gating of a nerve called the vagus nerve. And this vagus nerve controls the heart, among other things. Sensory information from all of your body is sent via this nerve to the brain, and it senses wounds and other invaders and signals immune information to the brain. The main purpose of the heart is to pump blood to various places where it's needed to support the production of the sound. From a listener's perspective, heart rate variability tracks, in part, the mood effects of music. Esther, while you were listening to Scott playing, uh -huh. your heart rate was very low. And, yeah, uh, I can see a dip. Yes. I can see it, and that's amazing. Yes, exactly. That is really cool. So he's playing a very relaxing piece of music. And now look how music. high it is. That's right. <laughs> You're stressing me out. <laughs> what about what you smell? This is a lavender hedge outside of Ormond College in Melbourne, Australia. Lavender is known to be a relaxing scent. And in fact, studies have been shown in animals that Sense, smelling lavender can induce slow-wave sleep, brain waves, even in animals. So although much of what we uh, smell, the moods that come about when we smell, are from that same association of previous times we've smelled it, again, there is something in the brain that is hardwired for many of these relaxing scents. I mentioned earlier that many of you had listed on the uh, Arizona Star blog uh, that the smell of creosote after the rain is something that makes you happy. The first time I smelled that here, I had no idea what it was. I was used to smelling citrus and uh, you know, lemon blossoms and orange blossoms in Florida. I'd never smelled the creosote after the rain, and it is a wonderful, sweet smell. Lydia Brunig, the lady who organized this amazing series, uh, told me a story which she allowed me to share, which is that when she moved away from Tucson for a short time, she missed home, and so she brought a sprig of creosote with her and hung it in the shower so she would be able to smell it. We can all do that. <laughs> so, if place can make you happy, can it also make you well? 
There is a famous landmark study published by Roger Ulrich in 1984 in the journal Science, the top science journal in the world, that started the field, that launched the field of evidence-based design. And what Roger Ulrich did, very similar to the Kuo and Sullivan study that I mentioned earlier, he did this a couple of decades before, he looked at patients who were recovering from gallbladder surgery who were randomly assigned to beds that had either a view of a grove of trees or a view of a brick wall. And these patients were all taken care of by the same doctors and nurses and staff. They all had the same surgery. And yet, the patients who had the tree view left hospital on average a day sooner, needed less pain medication, and had fewer negative nurses' notes. <laughs> they were happier. So again, we can ask, how does this work? Well, in order to answer that question, I'll first tell you something about the stress response. So there are elements of place that trigger the stress response. And these include noise, especially loud noises, crowding, bad smells, light, too much light or too little night light, and mazes. Does that re remind you of any particular kind of building? <laughs> a hospital? <laughs> How many of you think of a hospital as a calming, healing spa? <laughs> Our goal here at the University of Arizona at the Institute on Place and Well-Being that JP re referred to and that I'll tell you more about later. Our goal is that I will be able to ask that question and will not get a laugh. <laughs> so there's a science behind this, and it's the science of the brain's stress response. So what happens when you're stressed? Your brain releases a hormone from the brain's stress center, the hypothalamus. It's called CRH. That makes another hormone be released from the pituitary gland. That goes through the bloodstream and makes the adrenals release cortisol, cortisone. I'm sure you all are familiar with the drug cortisone. The Nobel Prize was given in 1950 for the discovery that cortisone could be used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. It is the most potent anti-inflammatory drug that our body makes. And you release this during the stress response. At the same time, adrenaline is released from the adrenal glands, and adrenaline-like uh, nerve chemicals are released from adrenaline-like nerves. And this is what makes you feel the way you feel when you're stressed, your heart beating fast, sweaty, running to the bathroom. That's all the physiological stress response. Now, how does that make you sick? When you are chronically stressed, you're pumping out that anti-inflammatory stress hormone cortisol. You're exposed to a bug, and the bug wins because the immune cells are unable to do their job to fight infection. Disease results when this connection between the brain and the immune system is out of balance. In chronic stress, when you're pumping out a lot of the anti-inflammatory cortisol, you are more prone to more frequent and severe viral infections like the flu and the common cold. If you go out to get your flu shot, you're less likely to have a good take rate to that vaccine because your cells won't be able to mount a good antibody response. There's prolonged wound healing, speeding of cancer growth, and speeding of chromosomal aging. Now, I want to emphasize that stress does not cause cancer. Your genes and various factors in the environment cause cancer. Stress does not cause the common cold or the flu. The flu bug causes the flu. Stress does not cause wounding. Wounding causes wounding. And stress doesn't cause aging. Aging, unfortunately, causes aging. <laughs> but stress speeds all of these activities, all of these conditions, because it impairs the immune system's ability to do its job and protect us and heal. So it just does not make sense 
to take a person who is already sick and already stressed and already anxious and put them in a building that makes all of that worse. <laughs> so the thesis that I put forward in my book, In Healing Spaces, is that place can play a very important role in helping to reduce that stress response. You heard from Chuck Raison earlier about meditation and social support. Uh, place is also very important in reducing that stress response. So when you're in a calming space, in a happy space, that hormonal stress response reduces, that adrenaline stress response reduces, and the vagus nerve kicked in, kicks in. You heard Julian Thayer speaking about the vagus nerve, that's the relaxation response. So I want you to all take a deep breath. Take a deep breath in, and then a deep breath out. If I were to put a heart rate variability monitor on every single one of you, this would be a great crowdsourcing study, I would be able to detect an immediate shift away from the stress response and towards the relaxation response, because we can measure the activity of that vagus nerve. And at the same time, Elements of place can induce endorphins, can stimulate dopamine, that reward chemical, that desire chemical of the brain. And all these things are good for the immune system and good for the heart. So understanding the science behind this can help us do something about it. So what can we do? We can incorporate elements into all our built spaces that help to reduce the stress response and enhance well-being. And those include spaces for exercise, spacious, spaces for social support, places for contemplation, meditation, and prayer, places that have gardens, views of uh, trees, green spaces, nature, and places for activities that engage the senses. So I'm going to show you uh, some examples from the field of hospital design, building design, and urban design. The design uh, profession, healthcare design architects, were the first, in my experience, to embrace these concepts. And it's because they understood that they needed to create better places for their, the patients and the staff in hospitals. So these are some examples of hospitals that have been built to be calming, soothing, happy places. Diamond Children's Hospital, a wonderful example built from the ground up with attention to every single one of these features, with places for the children to play, interactive walls, windows with views of the Catalina Mountains. When I visited, I went up to the uh, intensive care unit waiting room, a very stressful place for a parent. And yet it has, it's on the seventh floor, it has a spectacular views of the mountains. And I asked some of the parents how they feel, and they said they love to sit there because it's such a calming place. Tucson Medical Center, views of the mountains throughout. And they have patios, which the staff actually had competitions to see who could design the most pleasant, different, and interesting patios. This is the hummingbird patio. Uh, this is a patio that has places for people to sit. Again, social support is so important in healing. It's really interesting that the Tucson Medical Center started out as a tuberculosis sanatorium in the 19, uh, early 1900s, and Tucson itself from almost the, uh, the beginning of the railroad, actually, uh, was viewed as a health destination spa. And we have here world-class spas as well, so Tucson really is a healing place. Um, these principles are being applied to elder care facilities. One of the first places, parts of the brain to go in Alzheimer's is the part that remembers place, the hippocampus. If that is your problem, you will get easily lost. You will become anxious if you're in unfamiliar places. The clients who asked the architect of the Waveney Center in uh, New Canaan, Connecticut, specifically asked for a Main Street to be designed to look like Disneyland. 
because the people in that facility came from small towns throughout Connecticut where there was a main street, and they wanted their residents to feel at home and comfortable. And they included landmarks. They included landmarks for navigation, the large clock, the lamppost, to help them find their way. Views outside so that they could see if it's light, it's time for breakfast. If it's dark, it's time for dinner. Sight lines to the bathroom. It's the concept is you can use space and place as a mental prosthesis to help enhance memory of those whose memory of place is failing, and to allow people with those conditions to be independent for longer and and there and therefore happier. The military has embraced this. In a big way, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda is one of the newest hospitals that has just been built for returning wounded warriors with post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. It is a patient-centered, family-centered care facility. It has every possible. Uh, 3D visual imaging, 3D virtual reality suites to retrain these wounded warriors to learn, regain their balance. Uh, to have, they have brain imaging of every possible type, and they have a labyrinth. A labyrinth is a walking meditation. It's different from a maze because you don't have to think about where you walk. You just follow the line on the floor. And at the same time, it allows you to meditate. The military was so happy with the beneficial effects of these labyrinths in this hospital that they are now building labyrinths in all their new hospitals for traumatic brain injury and,、um, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is the newest labyrinth that they built outside、uh, of the Nyko Hospital in Bethesda. The Center for Health Design in San Francisco has done studies to quantitate the beneficial effects. On health of these kinds of changes in space, and they found, indeed, by looking at 50 hospitals across the country that retrofitted different、uh, wings and different、uh, different parts of the hospital, that they were able to show significant improvements with decreased patient falls, decreased medical errors, decreased infection rates, decreased nursing turnover, increased patient and,、uh, and nurse satisfaction, and family satisfaction, and decreased、um, uh, medication pain medication use. And it turns out that what's good for the patients and the staff and the families is good for the bottom line, because they calculated, and this is real numbers, by adding up all those the costs of retrofitting all those different hospitals, that it cost approximately 12 million dollars up front to build a better hospital, this fable hospital. But they were able to recoup almost all of that in the first year of operation of the hospital. By the health savings, and that's really relevant today. What about building design? I did a, a study with the General Services Administration that builds all the government buildings. When I was back in Washington at the National Institutes of Health, and the、uh, director of research for the green buildings for the uh, uh, GSA asked me if there was a way that we could measure people's stress and. Actually, productivity responses to old and new office space. So we compared the stress responses of people in old, crummy, dark, smelly, cramped office space compared to new, retrofitted, airy, sunny space in the same building with beautiful views and so on. And we found that looking at heart rate variability as one measure. That in fact there was an increase in heart rate variability, especially at night, which is a very healthy sign, in the people in the new office space compared to the people in the old office space. And on another measure of the stress response, there was a decrease in salivary cortisol in that stress hormone cortisol in the people in the new office space compared to the old. And the interesting thing about that study is, even though we were able to measure changes in their stress response that were significant, these people were not consciously aware of it. So place and space around you can affect your health and your well-being, even if you're not subjectively consciously aware of it. When I speak to architecture audiences, I say, 
that this proves that you take your buildings home with you at night. These concepts are being taken now into the workplace by, uh, by companies all over the world. Google is an example uh, of a company that really is embracing this and instituting these kinds of changes in all their office spaces and uh, workplaces around the world. This is a picture of the newly retrofitted um, uh, College of Architecture and Planning and Landscape Architecture. I know that Dean Cervelli is somewhere here in the audience. Um, and I took this pic picture the other day. It looks like that image on, on my right, your left, looks like it's outdoors. It's actually indoors. It's a beautiful, airy space for the students, for the, for the faculty to, to work in. The newest building that uh, is being built on campus here is going to be the same way. This is the uh, building for the Institute of the Environment. We just had a groundbreaking ceremony the other day, and it is modeled on the landscape of Arizona, and it is going to be a LEED certified, environmentally sustainable building. So you can make buildings that are environmentally sustainable and also support health and well-being. What about urban design? Well, you can apply the same kinds of principles. Put in sidewalks so people can walk and exercise. Exercise, you'll be hearing uh, on the next talk, is very healthy and helps you improve your mood. Um, this is Chicago again. This is the Magnificent Mile, one of the busiest streets in Chicago. And yet, just 10 paces off the street, there is this incredible, calming, happy place. It is the close of the Fourth Presbyterian Church. It's tiny, and yet it makes you feel happy. You can put parks with places to exercise. Tucson, as I said before, is a, is a perfect example of a healthy city, a city that is being designed and was designed to support health. In fact, this slide was lent to me by a member of the American Institute of Architects who's going around the world using it as an example of how cities should be designed with the modern streetcar and with bike lanes and views to the mountains and so on. If you don't have the luxury to have parks or views to the mountains, you can put in a roof garden. This is a roof garden on a hotel in downtown Los Angeles. If you sit there in that roof garden, you have no idea you're in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. Cabrini Green. Sorry to the Chicagoans. I have so many examples of Chicago. Uh, Cabrini Green was not green. <laughs> there were more bullets whizzing by than leaves floating down. And what they did in Chicago is they turned this into a city farm with a LEED certified sustainable building and uh, gardens for the children to play in, to, to help grow the vegetables, to have summer camps. If that picture of the little girl down there is not an image of happiness, I don't know what is. And we have the great good fortune to have the same thing here in, uh, in Tucson. This is a picture courtesy of Moses Thompson and Sally Marston, who are working together between the University of Arizona and the Tucson, <laughs> right, Tucson Unified School District to put in gardens in schools in Tucson. And you can see that happy child, that happy face. It makes such a difference. So there are tremendous public policy implications of all of this. And that's why we need the science to prove it, because if we're going to change policy, we can't do it just because we feel like it. We have to have the data, the rigorous scientific data, to prove it. As I've mentioned, this has implications for green building design, green hospital design, green urban design, for the environment and health, and for health policy and disease prevention. And this has become a movement a movement across the nation and across the world. The major standard setting and licensing bodies for green buildings and for the design profession are all embracing and rushing to include health and well being outcomes in licensing of design professionals 
and in standard setting for green buildings. And that includes the American Institute of Architects, the U.S. Green Building Council, the General Services Administration, the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, and it includes major organizations around the world, including, as you heard earlier, the Vatican. The reason I was invited to speak at the Vatican is there are 120,000 hospitals around the world that are affiliated with the Catholic orders. And the Vatican's Minister of Health asked me, how do we make those places healing? How do we enhance well-being and spirituality in the hospital setting? The challenge then is how do we prove this in rigorous scientific terms? And the good fortune is that we have the tools and the technology. We are at the frontier of a tremendously exciting era of health and well being, where we have the non invasive tools to measure these effects of place on people's health and well-being. One of the reasons I came to the University of Arizona is to create this Institute on Place and Well-Being. When Andy Weil and Victoria Mazes recruited me to be the director of research for the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, I said, that's really great. What would be the icing on the cake is if I could create this Institute on Place and Well-Being to take all of these principles into practice and to truly change the landscape of our health and happiness. And Victoria called Jan Cervelli up, the Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture, and she immediately, Jan immediately said, yes, this has been one of my dreams, and that's why I'm here. So, thank you. So we are creating an interdisciplinary institute linking the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, the College of Medicine, the College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture, and numerous other centers and institutes and colleges across the university. And they are expanding every day. And it's tremendously exciting to be in this place which is so collaborative and where we will be able to change the landscape of health. And we'll do it by research, the kinds of research that I described, by developing new curriculum for design professionals and health professionals to train the next generation in these principles, through practice and helping organizations incorporate these principles into their design and doing pre and post occupancy measures to in, you know, be sure that well being is being supported. And we are doing it with community outreach and community partnering. So many of you in this community have given us support to help us launch this, this endeavor, and I am so grateful to you. And I look forward to partnering with each and every one of you to really make Tucson a health destination for the next generation. So the future, the future is here. In medicine, we call it person-centered mobile health. That's where medicine is going. We're going to be able to track your health individually with all these kinds of devices. What I propose is that the real future is person and place-centered health and well-being, because we can track that too. And we can do it with all of these non-invasive devices like heart rate variability. We're developing a method to measure stress and immune biomarkers in sweat. Uh, the bioengineers we're working with in the Department of Surgery, Bijan Najafi, has all kinds of exciting ways. He calls them smart textiles, smart shirts, smart socks, to measure all kinds of aspects of health and well-being as you walk through real space in real time. But even if you don't have all these gizmos, you can create your own happy place. And how can you do that? This is an example of somebody who's created a happy place in their uh, office cubicle. They put a little garden, a dish garden there. They have pictures of favorite places and loved ones. 
and happy colors. This is a sand mandala that was built uh, about two or three weeks ago here by a group of monks from the Dripung uh, Monastery, the Tibetan monastery. And um, they were here for a week putting together this amazingly detailed, beautiful mandala of happiness. And I asked the head monk, would it be accurate to say that you are creating a happy place? And without hesitation, he said yes. And then he said, but it's not just the colors and the images that are happy. It's the process of doing it. And that harkens back to what Chuck Raison told you about meditation. You can be in a happy place, but also it's how you get there. We have Tumamak Hill here. How many of you walk Tumamak Hill? <laughs> It is an amazing, spiritual, beautiful space, which people in the local neighborhood use as their place of healing and of uh, spirituality and of happiness and exercise. So you see the, the people walking up the path there. It is across the street from St. Mary's Carondelet Hospital, and I understand that many of the caregivers of, uh, chronic care, of, of pain and palliative care hospice patients use the hill for that sense of calm. And we're actually starting a study on the hill to try to understand what is it about that desert sanctuary. That's the oldest desert sanctuary in the world. It's been here for 100 years, uh, managed by the uh, College of Science. What is it about that desert sanctuary? that can change your emotions and give you that sense of happiness and calm and spirituality. So I'm going to read to you, just in the last couple of minutes, from the last chapter of my book, Healing Spaces. The chapter is called Healing Gardens and My Place of Peace. My father and I sat on the terrace outside the kitchen door, eating breakfast early on a spring morning. He had propped a book against his oversized coffee mug, an old white china cup with the word dad inscribed on it. I didn't have to leave for school for at least an hour, and my mother and sister were still getting dressed. My father looked up at me from his book and smiled as I ate my cereal. Listen. Listen to the sounds of peace, he said. I heard a dog barking, birds chirping, the pock pock of a tennis court, a volley on the tennis court across the street. These sounds did not seem unusual to me. I heard them all the time. Not until many years later, after my father died, did I understand what they meant to him. He'd spoken those words in the mid 1950s when the war in Europe was only a decade behind him, still so fresh in his mind that he could appreciate such quiet moments and revel in a sense of peace. His favorite psalm was the 23rd. Sometimes after dinner, he would pull a Bible off the shelf and sit at the table and read it to my sister and me. Every once in a while, he would look at us with a smile that contained both wisdom and calm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. My father had walked through the valley of the shadow of death during the war somewhere in a concentration camp in a place called Transnistria. I found that out after he died. He had never talked about it. He was deeply spiritual, as I came to understand much later, although I never thought of him as religious. The reason I read that, and the reason I put this in the book, is that even if you do not have the luxury to go to Greece, or have a beautiful view out your window, or a garden. You can go to that happy place in your mind, 
or by reading a prayer or a poem. And I welcome you all to find your own happy place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Esther, that was wonderful. Uh, Esther will be uh, able to take questions over by the table where UA Bookstore is also selling copies of her book, Healing Spaces. Next uh, week, we have uh, Dr. David Reichlin from the School of Anthropology who will be talking about happiness and exercise. I hope to see you all then. Thank you.